North Korea would do well not to test his resolve or the strength of the armed forces of the United States in this region. We will defeat any attack and we will meet any use of conventional or nuclear weapons with an overwhelming and effective response. The era of strategic patience is over. The era of strategic patience is over. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence of North Korea as he visited South Korea on the first leg of his 10-day long Asia tour. Pence was expressing Washington's impatience with Pyongyang, especially after a new provocation over the weekend, testing the Trump administration's patience, but also exposing trouble in its missile program. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un says he's ready for an all-out war. All eyes are on the rogue state's unpredictable leader. High alert, the world on edge, escalating tensions in this part of the globe. How will the new U.S. president handle this foreign policy test? What about South Korea? What about China? The topic of our discussion today on Peninsula 24. Let's get it rolling. Our two of you are in Korea and around the world. Welcome to Peninsula 24. I'm Moon Gon Young. And here in the studio with me is Dr. Kim chang Su, Research Fellow Emeritus at Korea Institute for Defense Analyses. Thank you again for coming to our set this week. Thank you for inviting me again. Thank you. Of course, and to my left, uh, Park Won Gon, Professor of International Relations at Handong Global University. Thank you so much for being on my our pleasure. show. My pleasure. Now, um, so U.S. Vice President Mike Pence was here in South Korea earlier this week. Now. Pence said that neither the U.S. nor South Korea would tolerate further missile and or nuclear tests from North Korea in point blank, making note of um, U.S. attacks in Syria and Afghanistan that they show its resolve. Dr. Park, first of all, what are you making out of this, number one, Mike Pence's first visit to Seoul? Well, I was a little bit surprised because he has a, such a very strong statement and remarks about this North Korean threat than I expected. And of course, his visit is very important. First, he wanted to reaffirm ROK-US alliance and also US commitment to defend South Korea. And he very clearly mentioned that we will be with you 100% with South Korea. And also, he had a very strong warning and using a very strong language to North Korea. So if North Korea is, you know, stop the, if not stop the nuclear and missiles development program, then United States will do everything, and he does not exclude the possibility to using some military options. And also, he explained the United States North Korean strategy. And very recently, the President of um, Trump administration just announced the new North Korean strategy, and he probably explained in detail about this strategy to our government. And also, he doesn't forget to talk about that issue too. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned that that is totally a defensive measure. And he even mentioned that that is called for by and called for the alliance. And also, finally, he uh, delivered a message to China. And he reiterates not only President, uh, Vice President Pence also, but President Donald Trump mentioned the same thing several times, that if China is unable to deal with the North conundrum, the US and our allies will. So I think overall, as I just mentioned, that he made a very strong warning and also message both to North Korea and South Korea and also China. Now, Dr. Kim, the, the two refer, so Acting President Hwang Kyo-wan and Mike Pence, they refer to an ironclad alliance between South Korea and the U.S. Mike Pence said all options are on the table. Now, when he says all options are on the table, what does he mean? You know, it has a very different meaning. One is military options and also non-military options. But this time, his stress was on the military options because he said very specifically that neither the United States nor South Korea would tolerate for the missiles and nuclear tests. This is a very strong statement, as a matter of fact, mm. because putting a new red line is very difficult to keep. So at the risk of maybe a possible breaking of this kind of another red line, this is a very strong uh, word and also strong result that we are going to prevent anything 
we can do everything to prevent North Korea's another missiles and nuclear tests. This is a very strong and very highly calculated uh, remark, statesman's rather. As a deputy commander in chief of the U.S. Armed Forces, mm -hmm. he was not referring to the diplomatic or uh, economic you know, means because that's something you can do it in some other you know, venues. But this time, you know, visiting South Korea, visiting JSA, this as a deputy of the, the commander in chief, his stress was quietly on the, the military options rather than non-military options. Now that of course came a day after a failed uh, missile test by the North and two days after a huge display of its missiles and uh, weapons capabilities in Pyongyang. Now you saw the display of military force, then you have this failed launch. Now um, should that give the world a little bit of a breathing room that perhaps North Korea at this point at least is more style than, you know, substance, or is it in fact the opposite? Well, I don't think so, because uh, during this military parade for the so-called the Day of the Sun, 105th birthday of Kim Il-sung, and the North Korea um, introduced at least three new types of these missiles, and one of them we, um, you know, kind of um, think that that is the ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles. And we are not sure at this moment whether this, the, the new type of missile is actually is launchable and actually deployed this in the real battlefield. But one thing I'm pretty sure that is North Korea has a willingness to resist any kind of all the pressure that has been imposed by the United States. We all know that the United States just um, deployed this Calvin's the aircraft st strike group in the, on the mm -hmm. North Korea, uh, on the Korean Peninsula. And at the same time, and uh, Mike Pence just won one more time. And even though those kind of all the uh, pressure imposed by the United States, North Korea just the very next day launched another uh, ballistic missile, although it has been you know, reported that failed. So I think that North Korea has never give up its nuclear and missile program. And I think that's the important point. That mean that um, North Korea will likely launch test launch missiles in the near future and even possibly conduct a, a sixth nuclear test? That's something we should be ready for, we should be warned against because there's also all kinds of possibilities North Korea might want to anything the great, the super leader, the super leader dictates. And that's what exactly they state in their annual uh, New Year's address. So we are very keeping a very close watch on the next move of the United uh, North Korea because Donald Trump warned against the United North Korea's some further mis uh, mis missile strikes and also further nuclear tests. And this is a part of the North Korea's sophistication, kind of miniaturization and threat of weight reduction, and also the exchange the extending the range of missiles and also standardization and mobilization, all kind of the steps that they can really implement in terms of their ICBM capability and also uh, missile and nuclear capability. So they are approaching the final stage of this kind of very threatening missiles and nuclear weapons. That's why the United States was very specific and we just cannot endure anymore. Our strategic patience is over. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a very new, totally different approach to prevent North Korea from doing the next steps. So this is a very strong message. And going back to your question, as a, as a matter of fact, whether this was a style rather than in a substance, mm -hmm. I think both. Both. The North Korea is really trying to send a kind of conflicting message both ways. One, on the side, we really mean kind of be ready for any uh, any strikes from the outside, the United States and South Korea. But on the side, said, we, if the United States stops hostile policy against South against North Korea, we are willing to think about some other possibility. So this is a, sending a very conflicting and very confounding message to the outside world. That's, that's my interpretation. Is there a really a looming crisis? I mean, are we on the brink of a military conflict? I don't think so. This so-called April crisis is starting with this Donald Trump's possibility to exercise, to implement some kind of military option, which means they're going to attack military to North Korea. But I I think there is a very low possibility, if not the possibility at all, to the Donald Trump's administration to doing this kind of a military attack against North Korea. Well, people are a little bit confused between these two important concepts. One is the preemptive strike, the, the other is preventive strike. Mm -hmm. Right now, if, I, I, as I said, the Donald Trump administration has a very low possibility, but if they are doing this kind of military options, military um, activity, 
that is preventive, not the preemptive strike. I, let me explain briefly about these two different concepts. First, preemptive strike means that North Korea is just ready to hit us with their nuclear missiles, like within the 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Then we have every right to hit first uh, the, the um, nuclear warhead missiles. This is pretty much a lawful and legitimate the action that has been guaranteed by the international law. But the problem is, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to hit this uh, preemptively, the North Korean nuclear missiles, within like 30 minutes. We have to decide and also uh, we have to detect and we have to destroy these missiles within 30 minutes. I don't think it's possible. First, it is very difficult to know whether this missile is actually aiming to South Korea. We are not sure. And second one is that whether this missile has nuclear warhead or not, we are not sure either. So that's the very difficult option. And um, also preventive strike. The objective of preventive strike is to get rid of, eliminate, or eradicate the source, origin of the threat. So from the north, we have uh, two you know, very serious threat. One is, of course, nuclear development. The, the other is missiles. It's combined threat. It's a nuclear warhead missiles. So in order to get rid of this original threat, we have to destroy all nuclear-related facilities. Yongbyon and is well-known the nuclear plant, but also the North Korea is, has a rather highly enriched, highly enriched uranium facilities. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether it's the exact places. And also they have uh, more than 900 missiles, and also they have uh, more than 100 mobile launchers. So we you know, practically could not destroy all of them. So I don't think we can um, accomplish this objective of this preventive strike either. So, and also on top of that, if we have the attack, I mean United States attacked North Korea, it can be very easily escalated to the full-fledged war. Right. So Donald Trump, I don't think he can make this kind of decision. Even Donald Trump would not make such a decision. I think that's what you're saying. So how do you solve a problem like North Korea? So uh, that's China's Foreign Ministry spokesperson Liu Kang uh, making note of the highly sensitive and complex situation on the peninsula. This as U.S. President Donald Trump says China is working with Washington to solve the North Korea problem. So can we truly be confident that Trump can get China to pressure North Korea to abandon its nuclear weapons or so in a meaningful way? We have a correspondent in Beijing standing by for us, uh, Guo Xu Wu, CGTN joins us. Um, Guo Xu, how, how is China responding to the latest series of developments on the Korean Peninsula, which of course includes North Korea's failed missile launch? Hi, Jen. State Councilor Yang Jiechi has talked over the phone with the U.S. Secretary of State Tillerson on Sunday after the launch. Uh, they discussed about the situation on the peninsula and said Beijing and Washington should uh, manage and control their differences based on mutual respect. Also on Friday, when asked to comment on media reports that the DPRK is likely to test launch more missiles, China's foreign ministry uh, spokesperson Gong Shuang said that China has been following the development and the UN resolutions demand DPRK to abandon all the nuclear programs. Also one day ahead of the a grand military parade of DPRK, Beijing has urged Washington, Seoul and Pyongyang to stop irritating and threatening each other to prevent the situation from sliding to the point of being irreparable. China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi says is not the one who uh, espouses harsher rhetoric or uses a bigger fist will win. Uh, if war breaks out on the peninsula, nobody will actually win. So, Guoxi, we're also getting reports that China has sought to enlist Russia's help to help to cool tensions over North Korea and fears of, um, you know, among Beijing's leaders that hostilities between Pyongyang and Washington are imminent. How seriously is China um, taking the current situation and, and can we expect Beijing to take stronger measures to rein in North Korea? 
All right, China has always been calling for the resumption of dialogue and negotiation. China says the talks can be flexible. It doesn't necessarily to include six parties together. Foreign Minister Wang Yi says China supports and welcomes all kinds of dialogue, uh, regardless of if it's uh, formal or informal uh, for a denuclearization or peace mechanism or involves two, three, or four parties, as long as people just get back to the table and talk. Also, as you have mentioned, when you spoke with uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov over the phone on Friday, China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi says China and Russia will work together to cool down the tensions on the peninsula and try to bring uh, relevant parties back to the table. Also, China says it's likely and willing to offer a feasible and more detailed plan about the dual track approach and suspension for a suspension proposal and urging all relevant parties to give a careful consideration to that and offer more helpful advices to that. All right, Guo Gu Xiu Wu of CGTN reporting for us uh, from Beijing. Many thanks, Guo Xiu. Now, uh, gentlemen, China's official stance, when we sift through carefully, to me, appears a little changed. So what caught my attention, however, is Beijing's efforts to bring in Russia in, in reigning in North Korea, maybe, in cooling down the tensions on the peninsula. Your thoughts? Uh, the Chinese government has been very consistent in their policy toward, toward both North and South Korea. No war, no turbulence, and no missiles, mm -hmm. and no nuclear, nuclear weapons, rather. I think in that sense, on that sense, China has not been uh, changed at all. And I think they really believe this is really actually complementary to United States approach to North Korea. That is, on the one hand, you put exert extra pressure to North Korea to abandon its nuclear weapons and missiles. But on the other hand, China really wants to give a kind of an, a way out, other than because otherwise it's going to just, you know, out of desperate, they're going to do something terrible to China and South Korea and the United States as well. So they believe they kind of have been playing a kind of complement role with the United States. But this time, because of looming threats from North Korea, that uh, I think Beijing really began to believe that they should have sent a very strong message to North Korea. I really mean business. Mm. Stop doing this, and you'll we'll have a totally different approach from what we had done in the past. So I think on this end, if you look at the, the surface, the policy in, in principle remains almost unchanged. But in reality, when it comes to detail, China is, is showing kind of a change in their uh, approach to North Korea and its action plans as well. I agree with that. I mm -hmm. think that I can see a little bit change, not the fully change of the Chinese government attitude. But in order to understand the Chinese attitude and their perception, if they changed, we need to talk about this around the Trump's new North Korean strategy. And they just introduced this strategy a couple of days ago. And the title of this strategy is Maximum Pressure and Engagement. And actually, Washington Post uh, two days before they uh, introduced this uh, strategy. And I think there, this strategy has uh, some of the very important features. And first one is United States wanted to have a maximum pressure, not only the uh, North Korea, but also the China. China mm -hmm. is actually the main target to put more pressure on. Because in Washington, and probably Dr. Kim jong is know very well about that one, but the Washington, they consider that the China actually has key. China is export and supply most of the oil to North Korea and also import this most important, the North Korean's export coal. Mm -hmm. So if the China stopped or banning all those kind of things, then the North Korea has no choice but to give up their nuclear program. That's what the Washington has perceived, especially during the Trump administration. So the first feature of this new strategy is to put maximum pressure on China. And as I already mentioned that the Donald Trump and the ASI senior officials mentioned several times that if China not fully cooperate with the United States, the United States will act unilaterally alone. Mm -hmm. And that means the United States will impose some kind of a pressure and sanction on Chinese um, not government, but Chinese companies. We already experienced the so-called ZTE. That's the, one of the very strong and biggest, uh, not the strong, but biggest Chinese uh, company. But the United States government imposed tremendous amount of money and defy as a fine and penalty that this allegedly known that this Chinese company has an illegal trade with North Korea. Mm -hmm. And so 
United States government can do these kind of things. And also, United States can you know, prohibit any kind of financial transaction with North Korea. Most of the financial transaction is happen between the China and North Korea. So if United States decide to ban all these, these things, China's the institution, financial institution, will you know, have a you know, mega hit. And finally, United States still can have this so-called secondary boycott. And Obama administration actually you know, reviewed this to have the secondary boycott for several times. But if they impose this secondary boycott, it will really hurt the relationship between the United States and China. So Obama administration hasn't do that, done these kind of things. But Trump administration, I think they are very seriously considered to this kind of a secondary boycott. Some experts are, are now beginning to think that there could have been something, uh, some kind of negotiations between Trump and Xi Jinping at Mar-a-Lago um, during that time. And it was really under the table kind of talks, but something must have been established back then. I agree with that because that kind of you know, observation is very sure because at the first encounter of these two summits, they don't actually specify a very detailed accomplishment of, out of the summit because intentionally they hit something under the table mm -hmm. so that they can use it for later purposes. I think this is exactly what well, so I was referring to the kind of statement between the two summits. The particular words that really kept my mind attention was cooperation and communication. Mm. This is a Chinese expression because these two leaders wants to show that we are capable, this much capable solving North Korean issue. We should, we should not uh, endure and we should not you know, spend time waiting for the North Korea to come out to the negotiating table. Very strong message in that sense, that as, as I'm referring back to the last week, because it was a modest success as a first encounter that these two leaders are really serious about North Korean threats and we are going to solve it that period. I think in that sense, they, the, these two leaders must have been talking about to each other what kind of options we have on the table and what kind of real action plans we will have if there's another missile test, mm -hmm. if another there is a nuclear test, we are going to do, take this X and Y, Z steps. So I think it's still working on these issues, but there's something kind of consensus about the importance of North Korean threats. I'm pretty sure that they are they were talking about the North Korean issue in depth. And after the Sino, um, the U.S. summit, it reveals that these two leaders, they actually talk in person at least 30 to two hours. Is report have a different uh, kind of, a, you know. The, so important thing is that um, Donald Trump strongly urged the President Xi that doing far more actively mm -hmm. to stop the North Korean nuclear uh, the development. And I, I can see this one because right after this uh, summit, U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson uh, very clearly mentioned that to the report that Mr. Trump had warned Mr. Xi that U.S. was prepared uh, to an act alone if China did not do more to convince Pyongyang to abandon its nuclear program. Mm -hmm. That means already um, the Donald Trump and urge the President Xi to do something more and demand kind of these things. And as you just mentioned that, and even Twitter, and very recent Twitter, and President Trump mentioned that, quote, why would I call China a currency manipulator mm -hmm. when they are working with us on the North Korean problem? And he, we will see what happens. That means already in this summit, and Trump clearly mentioned that what he wants from the China and what he can give in return, mm -hmm. I suppose. So surely crunchy times here on the Korean Peninsula, and hopefully North Korean leader Kim Jong-un would not miscalculate the situation uh, about his chances of winning any military fight against the U.S. and South Korea, because any kind of the slightest mistake or miscalculation there could really um, erupt a war in this part of the region. So hopefully there won't be that and we'll be able to solve this in a very peaceful manner. In the meantime, uh, senior defense officials from Seoul, uh, Washington and Tokyo are set to meet this week for the defense trilateral talks in Tokyo, the first time since Donald Trump took office. So we'll keep a close eye on that meeting as well. All right, thank you gentlemen for today. It was wonderful today. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for staying with us all throughout our show. Um, that's all we have for today. And uh, we will be back next week because if it's midway through the week, it's Peninsula 24. If you want to find out what's happening in and around the Korean Peninsula, it's Peninsula 24.